He is on the advisory board for the, the NIAC committee for NASA and is uh, someone I have wanted to meet for years, having read some of his books, uh, both Mining the Sky and Rain of Iron and Ice, uh, very influential books on the asteroid mining community and the space advocacy community. Uh, Dr. Lewis is a professor emeritus of planetary sciences and the co-director of the Space Engineering Research Center at the University of Arizona. He was a professor of planetary sciences and chemistry at MIT and has uh, visited at major universities all over the world. He is uh, a forefront uh, expert in asteroids and what we can do with those and is the science advisor for Deep Space Industries, one of the commercial companies now looking at asteroid mining and how those resources can be used to help bootstrap that civilization we're also interested in seeing happen. So at this point, I'll turn it over to uh, John Lewis. Welcome. This can be used to advance the slides or otherwise. Please adjust your chronometers. It is now 5.16 a.m. at my home in Anacortes, Washington. I have never spoken this early in the day before. And uh, I noticed that you're under a similar handicap and that you have extremely comfortable chairs. So perhaps every, about every 10 minutes we'll stand up and do some jumping jacks or something like that. Um, the material in my slides is more than sufficient for the time available, so I'm going to dash through. And uh, what we'll do is if, if you find that you cannot consume all the output of the fire hose as it comes to you, simply email me. <coughs> It's not up there, jsl at u.arizona.edu, and I will send you copy, uh, I will email you a copy of my slides. All right, having said that, cutting the umbilical cord to Earth. We're going to start here where we are here and now, and we're going to ask the question, how could we possibly afford interstellar travel? And by the end of the presentation, you will have an answer to that question, okay? All right, we are uh, to some degree at the mercy of NASA, or at least we have been for many years. NASA thinks in terms of the Earth and the Moon primarily, and I want you to think outside that box, and I know all of you have thought way outside that box for many years, so have I, but let's step out one step at a time. Why space resources? Why are we going out into the solar system to use the materials there? First answer is launch costs are so high that anything that we can find in space that is useful to us, especially if it's relatively nearby and energetically accessible both from the point of view of transportation and extraction energy, could uh, greatly change the game. It could change the game from being one in which we could scarcely afford to lift a pint of water into orbit to one in which we would be wallowing in thousands of tons of space-derived resources. <clears throat> when we do a deep space mission, most of the mass that we launch from the ground into orbit is propellant, which has an intrinsic cost of cents per pound. And we, uh, if, we had, if NASA had to pay a value-added tax, They'd be out of business because once that stuff gets into orbit or gets, gets into an escape trajectory, it's worth about $10,000 a pound. Stuff that's intrinsically 20 cents a pound, suddenly $10,000 a pound, there's room for improvement. Fuels made in space can dramatically reduce that problem. And the same thing is true of all materials that are needed in space in high mass and with relatively low tech fabrication. Materials that are not as demanding as, for example, building a computer on the moon from scratch. So we're going to be looking at things that are required in large masses. 
and we're going to be looking at where we can find the raw materials to make them. Here are the candidate spots for finding them. The moon, well, the moon is nice, it's always nearby. It also has a significant gravity well, which means that getting things off the moon to be used in other locations is moderately challenging. Lunar resources are of prime importance on the moon. They're of very secondary importance off the moon. Next, we have the near-Earth asteroids. We have large numbers of near-Earth asteroids, some of which from time to time pass actually closer than the moon. The near-Earth asteroids, when I got into this business, there were about 40-some 40, 40 of them known. By the time I first published on the subject, there were, what, 84 of them, I think. The total is now 14,000 known near-Earth asteroids. Then we have the Martian moons, Phobos and Deimos, both of which are possibly captured former near-Earth asteroids. We don't really know yet, because we don't know enough about them to be sure. Then we have the asteroid belt. Well, the asteroid belt is quite a ways from here. However, the typical near-Earth asteroid, which passes by Earth at perihelion, also goes out to the asteroid belt at aphelion. So on each trip around the sun, that near-Earth asteroid gives you a means of transportation and a source of propellants and materials on the way out to the belt. How could we possibly take advantage of that coincidence? <laughs> <laughs> then we have, beyond the asteroid belt, the Trojan asteroids on Jupiter's orbit, 60 degrees ahead of Jupiter and behind Jupiter on its orbit around the sun, and the Jovian satellites. Start with the little ones. They're easier to digest. We actually have near-Earth asteroids who, that have aphelia near the orbit of Jupiter. Why? Because they're extinct short-period comets, Jupiter family comets. Extinct comets means that most of their interior is still a comet. But the surface has been devolatilized by solar heating and has a lag deposit of black dust on it. So we see this black asteroid, thanks to Victor Borgi, with an interior, a heart of ice. Maybe a meter thick layer of dust shrouding a vast wealth of volatiles. And then we have solar power. We certainly would like to be in a position to take full advantage of solar power. We'd like to, for example, build solar power satellites in geosynchronous orbit or any other orbit around Earth. Where do we get the raw materials to build those solar power satellites? Do we lift them uphill at enormous expense from the ground, or do we bring them downhill? Well, golly, that's a tough question. And then beyond using the nearby resources of space, if you're interested in going interstellar, you want lots and lots of energy. So we should be looking for large sources of helium-3 and deuterium for fusion. And for that purpose, I go to the Uranian planets, not the Jovian planets, not Jupiter and Saturn but to Uranus and Neptune because of their much shallower gravity wells. So here are the factors that govern our choice of where we go and what we do. First is energy accessibility. The outbound delta V from Earth orbit to the surface of that body. The most accessible bodies in nearby space are 2,500 known near-Earth asteroids and the Martian moons Phobos and Deimos. After them comes the moon. You mean it's actually easier for a given rocket booster to land a payload on Phobos than it is on our moon? Yes. Do the math. The moons of Mars are energetically more accessible than Earth's moon, especially for a round trip where you have to fight the moon's gravity both to land and to take off again. And then after that, we have another 10,000 plus known near-Earth asteroids that are not as energetically accessible as the moon. So lots of places to choose from, lots of possible starting places. What do we want to get? Well, first thing we want really is to get propellants, because if you have propellants, you can move anything you want from where it is to where you want it. Propellants are the first thing to go after, and the first resource in space at the moment 
The number one resource in space is water. I foresee a time when the number one resource in space will be human beings. <laughs> but we'll have to take another 15 or 20 minutes to get there. All right? Water is a component of many asteroids. Roughly one half of the near Earth asteroid population are either extinct short period comets or carbonaceous meteorites. We have analyzed countless meteorites, over 10,000 meteorites here on Earth. We have a good idea of what their composition is. In fact, we have such a good idea of it that I could just about fill this room with the literature on the subject. Um, or fill a single flash drive with it. Uh, the B, C, D, F, G, P, and perhaps T class asteroids all have between 1 and about 22% water by weight in them. Some of these, based on their orbits and their reflection spectra, are extinct short period comet cores. They may be 60% uh, ices, principally water ice. In the lunar regolith, we have solar wind implanted hydrogen to the extent of 50 to 100 parts per million in good places on the moon. Uh, mostly uh, carried by the mineral ilmenite, iron titanate, which is rich in the uh, Mare basins, the dark areas on the near side of the moon. Um, that is equivalent, if you, get, if you, if you recover 100% of the hydrogen from the ilmenite and, uh, and expel it as water, the hydrogen reacts with iron oxides in the ilmenite and other minerals to produce water. and will provide up to the equivalent of 0.1% water if you get perfect recovery of the hydrogen. Then we have native ferrous metals. The M-class asteroids are metallic. If you've seen an iron meteorite in a museum or seen photographs of one, they are uh, roughly 92% um, iron, roughly 7% nickel, roughly 1% cobalt, plus small amounts of other stuff, some of which is obnoxious, sulfides and so on, that you don't really want in your, your metal alloys. The lunar regolith contains about 0.1 to 0.5% of metal, most of which is of asteroidal origin. It is produced by asteroids with poor navigation systems accidentally running into the moon and excavating craters there and diluting the rich metal content of the asteroid impactor with a large amount of lunar slag. And the composition of the lunar surface is, to first approximation, the same as that of the slag that is discarded in metallurgical operations here on Earth. So processes to extract resources from the moon must be imaginative, persistent, and energy intensive. So typically, the richness of resources in the near-Earth asteroids is hundreds of times higher than on the moon. I mean, discount that by the fact that they're easier to get to, and obviously the moon's the place to go, right? <clears throat> All right. The strong points of the asteroids are a low outbound delta V from low Earth orbit to a landing on the surface, a very low inbound delta V, as low as 60 meters per second, to depart from the surface of the asteroid to an Earth intercept trajectory. And the near-Earth asteroids are very rich and diverse in their resources. There are dozens of different classes of meteorites known, probably 50. And we see that full range of diversity among the near-Earth population. The strong points of the moon are short trip times. The possibility of helium-3 recovery. I can't make the numbers work, but some people think they can and lunar polar ice. And uh, aside from the fact we don't know enough yet to say how we might do it, lunar polar ice is an interesting prospect if you enjoy mining at 50 Kelvin in permanent darkness. And if you understand about low temperature embrittlement of metals and the abrasive nature of the lunar regolith and the strength of ice at 50 Kelvin, which is similar to that of stainless steel, Go for it. <clears throat> Do you want fast or forever? All right, so what's a near-Earth asteroid, now that we've been talking about them? They're anything that approaches within 0.3 astronomical units of the Earth. 
astronomical unit, of course, is the mean distance of the Earth from the Sun. Many of them have passed inside the Moon's orbit. Many have struck the Earth. I invite you to go and visit a crater and take a good look at it. We have asteroids in our future for good and for ill. They are the immediate source, the near-Earth asteroids are the immediate source of the meteorites that fall on Earth. Even the pieces of, the, of Mars that we have in our meteorite collections have resided as fragments in the near-Earth swarm before, before colliding with Earth. We have our 10,000 analyzed meteorites so that we can understand what's there and how to, how to process it. We have many spectral matches between specific individual near-Earth asteroids and laboratory samples of meteorites, so we have a good idea of what asteroid X is actually made out of. And we see a, that very wide range of spectra and compositions that I mentioned. The near-Earth asteroids, as I mentioned, do have a significant overlap with the, uh, the bodies that we call comets. We have seen comets turn into near-Earth asteroids, and we have seen near-Earth asteroids turn into comets as a result of minor collisions. Okay. So there's, a, there's overlap there. There's a huge amount of good stuff in the near-Earth swarm. And we have Phobos and Deimos. They're not near-Earth asteroids, but maybe they once were. They are apparently, they're obviously quite dark. They have very low density. But they also have dry surfaces. And this is possibly a result of collisional processing inside the gravitational well of Mars. The, the gravitational potential gradient is fairly steep there. So the debris, which has been shock heated and ejected by impacts from Phobos and Deimos, will fall back onto them. It will, has a very high probability of being re accreted by those moons, and having been shock heated, it'll be dehydrated. The search for near-Earth asteroids actually uh, was motivated long before the first one was known. Back in 1660, Sir Isaac Newton pointed out the possibility of cosmic collisions with the Earth. Well, I'm sure a source of great hilarity to his contemporaries. In 1898, somewhat after Newton's death, as you can see, the first near-Earth asteroid was discovered accidentally. In 1960, the first systematic search for asteroids, near-Earth asteroids, was begun by Tom Gerrels. Um, then, I, see, I think he was at the University of Chicago at the time, and uh, carried on at the University of Arizona for many years. In 1985, Gerrels founded the University of Arizona. I put it in red there so that you will not confuse it with the University of Alberta, the University of Alabama, and the University of Alaska. The University of Arizona's Space Watch program was begun, a dedicated 36-inch, you know, call, call it nearly a meter, telescope for searching for near-Earth asteroids. In 1995, my book, Rain of Iron and Ice, was published. And in 1997, NASA began putting significant fundings into finding near-Earth asteroids. That may be a coincidence. In fact, it probably is a coincidence. <laughs> but if it isn't, I'm very happy. <laughs> Here's the discovery rate. When I got aboard this business, right about here, <laughs> there were very few near-Earth asteroids, very few spectra. Why waste your time worrying about things that are so rare and so unimportant, right? But then, with Space Watch in red, discoveries began, ah, well, I can do that, too. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, then, right after uh, Space Watch had demonstrated the desirability and the feasibility of searching, as new technologies rolled in, new search programs were initiated, and you'll see them spelled out here. Uh, you'll see that Linear, the Lincoln Laboratories Near-Earth Asteroid uh, uh, Search Program, Blue, was extremely successful for many years. It was succeeded in turn by the Catalina uh, Asteroid Search Program, which is actually headquartered in my former office at the University of Arizona. Again, coincidence. You know? 
uh, and my my ristra, my big uh, my big chain of dried chilies is still in that office. So <laughs> then, uh, pan stars again, another generation of technology. And uh, how has the discovery rate increased? Well, it's now up to about 1,600 new ones per year. If I had known about this back when I, when I only knew of a few dozen of them, I think I probably would have swooned. That was back in the Victorian era when swooning was still legal. Right? So here we have discovery rates, 1,500 new ones per year, and accelerating as new technologies come in. Here's what the orbits of the known near-Earth asteroids look like. I'm afraid this is about a year old. It's worse now. And you, it, those of you who are capable of paranoid fantasies will look at this and say, look, here's the orbit of Earth, and look how many near-Earth asteroids are right near us. They're ganging up on us. You know? It's a plot. It's a conspiracy. Well, well the reason, of course, look, Virtually all the known near-Earth asteroids are small. Because they're small, they can only be found if they're very close. Therefore, we find the close ones. So if we had a, a God's eye view of the inner solar system with all the near-Earth asteroids actually on it, it wouldn't look like that. It would be a much broader smear. But there they are, going into Venus going into Mercury, going way inside Mercury's orbit. And, well, look at this. You know, the, the inner edge of the asteroid belt is right about here. Lots and lots of them go out to the asteroid belt. The ones that are big enough so that we can, we can say that we have essentially a complete uh, discovery of the known population. Most of them go out to the asteroid belt. The average orbital eccentricity is 0.5. So they're in quite elongated orbits. And uh, here we are. So what do we know about the population? We have over 1,000, roughly 1,000, kilometer-sized or larger near-Earth asteroids. The biggest is about 30 kilometers long. That would ruin your entire weekend if it were to hit Earth. There are about 100,000 of them that are bigger than 100 meters in diameter. Orbital periods generally mostly range from 0.9 years to 7 years, with a peak around 4 years. The orbital inclinations are usually around 10 to 20 degrees. The distribution of orbital inclinations looks sort of like that. So most of them are uh, 10 to 20 degree inclinations. Zero degree inclination asteroids are essentially unknown. Very simple reason. If they have zero degree inclination, then they, when they cross the orbits of the terrestrial planets, they are right in the same plane as the planets. So there is a survival of the fittest. The ones that have enough inclination to avoid collisions live longer. The ones that are playing on the freeway, not so much. And uh, most, I mentioned before that most near-Earth asteroids pass through the belt. Greater than 13,000, no, let's make that 14,000, and by, by the end of my talk, it'll probably be larger. What are, they, what are they like? What would you see if you landed on one? Well, we have pictures here of four different near-Earth asteroids. One of them, well, two of them actually in color. Um, there is some question about the color registration on this one. This was... Uh, I actually narrated the launch of that spacecraft on China Central Television. <laughs> That's from the Chang'e 2 uh, mission. What do we see? Well, we see stuff that looks like crushed rock, regolith, sort of lunar type surface. And when we get, have close up pictures, we see big chunks. We see some, some of them look heavily cratered and don't seem to have uh, much evidence of thick layers of dust and rubble on, on the surface. We can actually see, uh, combine this with, with close-up photographs taken by the dozen spacecraft that have flown by asteroids at close range. We can find everything from dust to sand to gravel to house-sized boulders to monoliths, asteroids that are, look like snowmen. They appear to be the results of two or more asteroids colliding gently with each other and sticking together. And we have... Chendrumov-Krasimenka, 
Good grief. What was, it, what was quality control like in the factory that made that thing? The union job. Government contractor, yes. Well, that's, that's quite possible. It was a cost plus fixed fee contract. <laughs> okay, so what do we need to do to use this stuff? We need to anchor to the surface of the asteroid. We need to pick up surface materials. We need to be able to convey it into our spacecraft. We need to seal it inside because we're going to be releasing gases from it. We don't want them to escape into space. We need, in many cases, especially if we're going after metals, a means of beneficiating ores, meaning to concentrate the things you really want. We need to extract the materials we need and concentrate them and transport them to Earth orbit and process them into finished products, presumably in a highly eccentric Earth orbit, which is an ideal orbit because it gives you easy access to Earth, easy access to the Moon, easy access to Mars. It's a highly desirable place to be. And then you need to deliver your products, propellants, or whatever to their site of demand. And of course, Deep Space Industries has been talking to lots of people about who needs what, where, when. I'm sure our competitors are doing the same. They're all former students of mine, don't you? <laughs> so we need a harpoon, or a net, or a belt, or a wire, or a girdle of some sort to attach to the asteroid. Electromagnetic conveyance, sealing in a dusty vacuum, catching the volatiles, and then returning to Earth. And the best way to return to Earth, the most efficient way to do it, is solar thermal propulsion using the water you extracted from the asteroid as the working fluid. So you don't have to carry any propellant with you to get the stuff back to Earth. And then you manufacture propellants in Earth orbit for the next outbound trip, where, wherever you're going. I don't care if you're going to the moon or to Mars or whatever. If you're going back out, if you are going back out, then you can use propellants that we will gladly sell to you. <laughs> Just, we'll talk about that later. If you have a need, let me know. All right. Examples of processing schemes, ice extraction and melting uh, by melting or sublimation. Water extraction from silicates, micas, layer lattice silicates, phyllosilicates, clays. They have silicate sheets with hydroxyl attached to the silicates and, in many cases, with interlayer water of hydration between those layers. Some micas contain so much water that if you heat them up, they puff up like popcorn. So uh, you have to heat it enough to get the, the chemically bound water out. Uh, the carbonaceous meteorites also contain water-soluble and hydrated salts, such as gypsum and epsomite. Heat them up, they give off water. If we electrolyze water, we can produce hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen and oxygen can be used as cryogens for uh, you know, hydrogen-oxygen engines, uh, space shuttle type technology. Or you can use the hydrogen and oxygen to make storable propellants. Storable propellants that you can take anywhere. You don't have to worry about refrigeration and long-term storage of liquid hydrogen, for example. That's a, uh, a challenge. Ferrous metals can be volatilized by reacting them with carbon monoxide gas. It's called the Mond process. Mond being the name of the German chemist, Ludwig Mond, who invented the process. It's also the German word for moon. Coincidence. You can volatilize them by reacting iron and nickel with carbon monoxide at 200 Celsius and 30 to 100 atmospheres pressure to produce gaseous iron pentacarbonyl and nickel tetracarbonyl, which are mobile liquids with physical properties similar to water. These can then be separated from each other by distillation selectively decomposed to, pre to precipitate by means of either chemical vapor deposition or laser chemical uh, deposition. Ultra-pure iron, ultra-pure nickel. The ultra-pure iron is six nines iron, 99.9999%. It has the corrosion resistance of stainless steel. 
All right, how much stuff is there in the near Earth swarm? 120 trillion tons is the approximate estimate of the mass of the near Earth asteroid swarm. We have about 40 trillion tons of ferrous metals, mostly in the metallic state, well, half in the metallic state at least. We have at least, this is a conservative number, two trillion tons of water. And the Earth's surface market value of these various resources and the metals are given here at the bottom. Metallic iron, 11 quadrillion dollars worth. Nickel, 70 quadrillion dollars worth. Cobalt, another 70 quadrillion. And platinum group metal, 70 quadrillion. Do I need to explain that we are not going to bring these back to Earth? <laughs> First of all, one of our competitors has made a great, a great uh, story about going out to mine platinum group metals from near-Earth asteroids and bringing them back to Earth. Uh -uh. One ton of asteroid metal contains about $7,000 worth of platinum group metals. If you can go out there, mine a, 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 a huge chunk of native iron, extract the platinum group metals from it, and ship them back to Earth, for $7,000 per ton of metal you processed, then you know some technologies that I don't know. It does not work economically. But if you are doing large scale uh, construction using iron and nickel in space, then you have a byproduct of platinum group metals. And good grief, what are you going to do with a few tons of platinum group metals that you don't want? Well, send them back to Earth, of course. You know, email them as attachments to your girlfriend. <laughs> now, let's talk about demandite for a couple of minutes. Yes, I am, I am past the peak of the distribution here. Right? The end is in sight. Demandite is all the materials in the correct proportions that are needed to support modern civilization. The unit of demandite I will use as the amount of resources required to support one human being for life with material recycling, the only input to the system being solar, solar power. Okay. okay, this is an eye chart. I'm hoping that none of you will be able to read it, because if you do, it will take too long. <laughs> The resources in the near-Earth asteroid swarm are sufficient to support, I've gone through you know, all the different materials you need, are sufficient to support a population which is at least 10 times as large as the ultimate carrying capacity of Earth's surface until the sun dies or gets sick. It's called the red giant phase. When it, runs, when it gets cooler and runs a fever and turns red. Uh, 10 times what we need to support everybody on Earth. Are we going to do this on Earth? Well, obviously not. All right, so uh, let's, let's talk now about the practicalities. Direct use of water as a propellant can help you move this stuff around, move the metals into Earth orbit, move the propellants, uh, use the propellants to uh, propel outbound missions. Solar thermal propulsion I mentioned. Nuclear thermal propulsion is also on the table. It is not uh, a favorite of the Sierra Club, but uh, the technology exists. In fact, the technology existed in the 1950s. People are not generally aware of this, but there were experiments with nuclear thermal propulsion done in Nevada back in the late 1950s. Electrolyze the water to hydrogen and oxygen. You can use the hydrogen for solar thermal propulsion with extremely high specific impulse. You use a refractory material such as rhenium or thorium oxide to manufacture a thrust chamber. You use a solar collector to focus sunlight onto the thrust chamber and you trickle water or hydrogen into that chamber and it comes roaring out at up to 3,000 Kelvin. Tremendous performance. Or you can do cryogens, right? We've been concentrating, for the sake of filling in a gap in our understanding, on the manufacture of storable propellants in deep space industries. 
The general scheme is to extract hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen from near Earth asteroids as water and CO2. The ideal source among meteorites is the carbonaceous asteroids, the C type asteroids. The C type asteroids, carbonaceous chondrites, CI chondrites, type 1, contain hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur to the extent of up to 40% of the total mass of the meteorite. 40%. If you're lucky enough to land on an extinct comet core, you blow away the carbonaceous dust because it's only 40% volatiles. And then you have the underlying stuff, which is about 80% volatiles, 60-some percent ices, and the rest water bound in the silicate component, the mineral component. So we've had a, 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 a lot of experience with this, and you'll be hearing about it in the near future. We had a, we've just completed a NIAC phase one grant uh, looking at the feasibility of manufacturing uh, storable propellants, high test hydrogen peroxide as the oxidizer, and methanol or dimethyl ether as the fuel. Um, we are uh, finishing the proposal for phase two NIAC right now to fill in some of the technical gaps in the processing scheme. And we're doing that at the University of Arizona. That's why I've been in Tucson a lot in the last few months. And uh, we'll be, I hope, working on that for the next two years. What about structural metals? Well, iron. Why not iron? We know how to make 6 nines iron. It's so corrosion resistant, you could have a, a wet, oxygen-rich atmosphere inside it, and it would not corrode. It's not iron that corrodes. It's iron with defects in it that corrodes. And the defects are foreign elements, or voids, or cracks. So here we go. Then we can use the nickel for high precision vapor deposition, 3D printing, or mold filling, straight chemical vapor deposition, to make super sophisticated components. I, I, I wish I had an hour to tell you about some of those things, but uh, I don't. And then bulk radiation shielding. You'll need that in space no matter where we go. Our whole galaxy is infested by those blasted little cosmic rays. And we have reason to believe that they're not localized to our galaxy. So even those of you planning long trips, you need to think about this. Uh, I think I'll let that go by. We, I said that the near-Earth asteroids, many of the near-Earth asteroids, will give you a trip to the asteroid belt. So what are the asteroid belt's resources? This is the same table as we did for the near-Earth asteroids, but it shows that the population that we could support by means of using all the known resources of the asteroid belt is actually 10 to the 16th people, 1 million times the ultimate carrying capacity of Earth. Again, the only consumable needed to maintain that size population would be solar power. So there is a considerable future ahead of us. just summarizes what I just said. So beyond the belt, there's still a lot more. At the point where the asteroid belt is highly utilized, which I would estimate as about 2600 AD, we would have 10 quadrillion people, pretty good tax base. <laughs> How could we afford to go interstellar? And here's the answer that I promised you. Just have the kids hold a bake sale. Okay. You need 10 to the 15th, 10 to the 16th dollars? No problem. You'll probably have enough money left over from their, or, or, or do, maybe they might do a Kickstarter, you know? You might have enough money left over to terraform Mars and Venus in the bargain. But that's just small potatoes compared to the population you already have. What do you go after first when you've got the, uh, the asteroid belt uh, populated and you have speed limits because of the children who are out there buzzing around from asteroid to asteroid? You, know, you can picture the signs now. Well, where do you go for propellants next? You go to Uranus and you go after helium-3 and deuterium. Uh, I developed a scenario for doing that back in the previous millennium 
back in the mid 1990s, helium 3 and deuterium for large amounts of power. So, what do the wise people say to us? H.G. Wells says, there's no way back into the past. The choice is the universe or nothing. And William Jennings Bryan, who has not run for president recently, but did many times, <laughs> destiny is not a matter of chance. It is a matter of choice. It is not a thing to be waited for. It is a thing to be achieved. What could 10 quadrillion people achieve? What would we do with one million Einsteins? This is the point in a talk where people normally say the end. And I'm not done. I'm just pointing out that this, the point of liberation from Earth, is a first step. The point of liberation from the solar system is a second step. This is the beginning of human civilization. Tip Thorpe. I think that it's clear that it is attainable to colonize the solar system. I will not argue with him. Getting beyond the solar system is going to be exceedingly difficult. We are going to either require a lot of brute force over a period of several centuries. Hey, I just gave you five centuries. <laughs> or else a brilliant idea that none of us has grasped yet. I, I, I know what it is, but I, I'm not at liberty to tell you. <laughs> the first thing is the solar system. But we have not been moving at anything like the pace that we could or we should. More wisdom. Longest journey begins with single asteroid. <laughs> Phone shoot. And, and... Let me say that if we don't do it, somebody will. <laughs> the end. We do have time for questions, so if you have a question, raise your hand and our runner will come to you with the uh, microphone. We also have time for answers. Some of the questions I raised. <laughs> If you want to tell us without patent protection, that is. You can call on whoever you want. Of course, microphone. Someone has a microphone here, so maybe I can call myself. Okay. Hi. Um, uh, Philip Lubin, UC Santa Barbara. So, uh, one quick question is that the materials required to support uh, uh, humanity, which you listed uh, so nicely there, um, uh, just want to point out one thing that you know people are, are uh, not transmutators they're simply um, users and expellers of material um, and to some extent you know people can be considered as resources as well so the same extraction methods that you would use on an asteroid you could consider using on people um, now I, I don't want to take that to the next extreme because it'll gross out the audience here but uh, simply to point out that the materials that we input and output the output can be re-input with uh, proper processing, in the same way that you would do on an asteroid. These are, yeah, these are massively closed systems. Uh, is there a microphone we get? Uh, okay, one, one um, more back here. <clears throat> yeah. What sort of power levels are required to process the uh, iron, for example? The, uh, the reaction of carbon monoxide with the uh, with iron and nickel is uh, relatively mild. It's it's about one tenth or one twentieth of the energy required to melt and cast the metals. So uh, you, you can uh, imagine a, a typical iron production uh, scenario here on Earth and divide the energy requirement per pound by about a factor of ten. So uh, it's not super challenging. And uh, once you have materials made of ultra pure iron and ultra pure nickel, they'll not only have a very long operational lifetime because of their corrosion resistance, but they'll be so pure that they themselves will be easily recycled. One last question. Okay, you were talking about mining uh, an asteroid, extracting the materials from it. 
Depending on the size of the asteroid, how long could a project to extract the useful materials from it last? It depends entirely on the size of the asteroid and its composition. Um, however, we're talking here about a processing scheme that would take centuries to do in its entirety. I think the, the, uh, the time scale for the growth of human population pretty much determines the size of the labor force that's available to do the work and also determines the size of the resources that are available to fund the work. So uh, I, I picture this as being a roughly exponentially growing process. Very good, thank you.